Greetings, fellow adventurers, and welcome to the Couple of Nerds podcast. I'm D&D Wife, the creator of dndwifestories.com, and your co-host. Joining me is the man behind the screen, my brilliant dungeon master, and also my husband, Egile. Say hi, Egile. Hey, everyone. Excited to be here sharing our nerdy adventures with all of you. Absolutely. So what's Couple of Nerds all about? Well, we're diving into the realms of Extraeus, sharing our experiences, playing D&D in our apartment, and exploring the intricate tapestry of relationships both in and out of the game. And we got some exciting segments for you all. From lore deep dives to crafting tips, artwork showcases, and relationship advice on and off the table, we've got a little bit of everything for every kind of adventurer. So whether you're a seasoned adventurer or a tabletop newbie, we invite you to join us today. Tune in, relax, and enjoy the magic of Couple of Nerds. May your roles be natural 20s and your adventures be legendary. <laughs> Mikhail, what, what's wrong? He took my tail. But, but, but why are you crying? It's just your tail. But it means everything to me. Uh, your, your tail does? Yes, it's, it's everything. But why? You're a very accomplished bard. You've still got your hands. You can play beautifully. I would give my hands up in a moment to keep my tail. But, but why is your tail so important? We, because Mama told me all the time that the tail is the source of our powers. What? It shows who we are and it's gone. But, but how could that possibly... Sh- everything well what she what she used to when she tucked me in when I go to sleep she she used to be the best prostitute in the brothel but she always had time for me oh oh well that's great that she had so much time for you she yeah, she would tell me about the great divine dragon and how it carried away all the souls of the scale kin to save them from destruction from the forces of evil oh then she said this dragon it, it had to make a nest so it formed the whole planet <gasps> and and in that all of the scale kin were born and then and then we had to start all over so we had to be the smallest but the strongest to potential and that's really? us the kobolds <gasps> and then she would tell me that that the great divine dragon would say that all we had to do was consume more power and then we would grow things like wings and our tails would become larger and we would become big enough and then we would return to the stars and we would go back to where we were from and no more pain no more war Uh, oh wow but that's gone now oh well, uh, don't don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. There's there's so much more to live for. Well, I know of this very elusive people called the Elam, right? Huh? They live on a completely different continent, and they told me a story while I was there, and it's the story of how they were created, and they lost something too, very important, just like you did. Really? Yeah. Let me tell you, when the land was first born. It was peaceful. Creatures could roam without worry. Then a great shadow spread across the land, and in response, the primal energy of the land roared. The primal essence coalesced the elements into beings filled with thought and emotion. These new beings did not know what they were or their purpose, but when the shadows rose up, these new elem fought and drove them back. They are some of the few that can fight the shadows and succeed. But the knowledge of the strength has been a little lost with the separation of the lands that once were. When the great tree disappeared and sundered the land into many, the knowledge was lost in the chaos. They lost something? Mm -hmm. And it was very important to them, this knowledge that they could fight the shadows. And now, however, the Elam roam, but with them, they bring their kin their families, and they have great communities full of new life and new purpose. 
So even though you've lost something that's really important to you, you can find a new purpose, Miguel. You can focus on things like your music and make them beautiful because of your pain. If you say so, but I, I just don't know. No. Uh, the healing will come with time, darling. I just hope we get there soon. Me too. I really hate the green one! Uh, I know. I'm sorry. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Couple of Nerds. I'm your host, D&D Wife, and with me is my co-host, Dungeon Master and Husband, Eguile. <laughs> yeah, my, my voice is going to be a little sore after that one. <laughs> that was fun, though. I Yeah, I, I, it kind of also makes me happy that Miguel is not a long-running NPC, because I don't think my throat can hold that. Oof, yeah, that is tough. But <laughs> this is our lore drop segment, and in this segment, we're going to be talking about the Scalekin and the Elm, which are two of our uh, unique species to extract. Yeah, and this is part two of our three-part series looking at the specialized mm-hmm. kind of unique species that we have that exist within Extraeus. Though they take homage and a little nods to other systems, mm-hmm. we put a nice, unique, chaotic spin to each one. And I feel like these two have a very important uh, impact between you and I. Definitely. And and these are just the uh, the intelligent species. Animals are in a separate category. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And creatures obviously. are in their separate category, these too. These are more like, look at, like playable races <laughs> yes, in our game. exactly. Our that same sort of uh, style, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and, and the big, uh, you know, impact we have on these two particular races mm-hmm. is that you work exclusively on the Elm, yes. and I exclusively on the Scalekin, mm-hmm. and that this is one of those unique parts where I, as the DM, is I'm, I'm not necessarily the, the entirety of a creator of one of the species in the in the world. Yeah. So it is this kind of unique system of, okay, cool, well, what do they do? How do they, what's their culture? And mm-hmm. I get to kind of have a nice little unique spin on learning about other races in my world. Yeah, so that's going to be super fun to kind of give you insight into the world, <laughs> which is going to be weird. And, and it's always important as a framework to mm-hmm. get started is kind of learn a little bit about the base cultures yeah. and the base races. So that Mm -hmm. way you have a better understanding of how they intermingle and how Mm -hmm. they are entwined in the world. Now, in our world, it's this very unique situation as many of them are separate. Yes. uh, So the because the the great tree kind of disappeared from the world, it broke the land and the species, uh, which already had sort of like central locations where they were located, were stuck in those locations. Yeah, and and that isolation, of course, always kind of not only breeds contempt for Mm -hmm. the others, but also kind of really kind of isolates them within their own communities, Mm -hmm. their own belief systems. So we get to see this kind of hyper-realization of different kind of cultural systems because they're so isolated but it makes for really cool experiences and really cool storytelling yeah the the interesting thing is because they're separated they're separated by a lot of chaotic water uh there's a lot of water in between a lot of ocean in between the continents so it makes it super difficult to travel between them um so i think kind of giving people an idea when they might not see an elem or a scale kin in our campaign for a while might you know help the lore a little bit Yeah, so we want everyone to kind of buckle up, sit with us now Mm -hmm. as we take a very deep dive more into the kind of inner workings of Extraeus. And as always, to any of my players, if you're listening, you have been warned there Mm -hmm. are spoilers, maybe things you don't want to learn quite yet. So I recommend uh, not, not, not listening, but maybe, you know, kind of ignore some of the more hidden meaty parts. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, but first, we really want to look to and what is really near and dear to my heart, but that's the scale kin. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was the one where I was like, okay, this is me. I have to have some sort of draconic representation in my world yeah. um, because I very much love the dragon part of Dungeons and Dragons. Mm-hmm. It's been your favorite part <laughs> since it, we started. It, <laughs> it is very much my motif in the first campaign I ran. It was very draconic focused. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of my kind of merch and, and gear around me is draconic conic focus yeah you love dragons Um, so i really wanted to take an opportunity to both pay respect and kind of put a new spin on traditional draconic norms um and sprinkle in kind of an extraneous vibe to that Mm -hmm. and that's why i came up with the uh scale kin yeah um and the the interesting part of the kind of the origin of the scale kin and much like how you know miguel has a kind of an understanding and (laughs) as most bedtime stories there's a hint of truth and Mm -hmm. a, a lot of fairy tale yeah <laughs> um, but in reality the 
<clears throat> the Scalekin themselves are very much these kind of interstellar refugees mm -hmm. uh, by way of in the former universe, the former setting that our story once was uh, a grand draconic being was mm -hmm. separated violently. Yeah. And in doing so, there was one aspect of that being that was the most compassionate, the most willing to give himself mm -hmm. to that goal. And it's not who you think. <laughs> As our story went <laughs> on, this individual kind of took all these essences, the remainder of all draconic kind, all scale folk, not mm -hmm. just dragonborn or kobolds, but every aspect of what we refer to as the scale kit. Yeah. And what that allowed was this kind of new mixing of a new species. Mm -hmm. And as this cosmic deity kind of held on and embraced itself to the impact of this explosion, it was kind of jettisoned out into the universe. Yeah. And as it broke through dimensional barriers, it continued to hold on to these essences, keeping them safe like a, like a draconic mother would her brood. Uh, and in doing so, it kind of, infuse more of itself to sustain these last essences the last remaining embers of draconic mm. kind even as it was dying right every every time it broke through like a dimensional wave it's like bam more of its life has <sighs> to be keep has to be sacrificed to keep these essences mm -hmm. alive as they are the weakest of the weakest but in doing so it eventually found itself uh, around kind of this new coalescing body of land, which would soon form to become extraits. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, it was partially kind of brought into the land of Extraeus and became part of its kind of materials that created Extraeus, the kind of heart components. Oh. And in doing so, the essences of the scalekin were allowed to kind of be reborn through Extraeus itself, through essentially this kind of divine draconic carcass that was remaining, this exoskeleton of their divine protector. Yeah. And what happened was, is all of the merging, all of the traits and all the properties of all draconic, all scale-like kind mm -hmm. came together and reformed into one singular creature type. Mm. This is the scale kin. Yeah. And what makes them unique is they do start off as a kobold, this mm -hmm. kind of smaller draconic creature, but very versatile, much like the Humes, but in a sense that they have the potential to go in only upward directions mm -hmm. as they consume, as they eat, like as, it, as the story goes, sources of power, places of magic, stones, elements, everything that they could literally get their hands on, much like traditional cobalt lore. And <laughs> yeah, lore anything with power. Would just digest everything. Mm -hmm. But in doing so, they eventually reach a point where they begin to mature and change. Yeah. They evolve for a better sake of the word mm -hmm. and as they do they become other forms of draconic life first maturing into what would be more like a dragon born from dra from D, &D. Uh, but even further become things like wyverns become even become young dragons moving up the draconic scale going up to where they become these ancient dragons depending on how large of a source of power they can consume wow okay so their their gift is this ability that if they just kind of continue to grow and continue to consume and live mm -hmm. they themselves will grow stronger and become these larger more evolved versions of themselves Wow. But a lot of times, because they've been so insulated, mm -hmm. they suffered harshly. And what ended up happening was there were so many kobolds that were kind of left onto these islands yeah. that they called their home, but food was so scarce. Mm -hmm. And because of that scarcity, that unfortunately caused mass cannibalism yeah and this is in the early developmental developed cycle of the cobalt mm -hmm. and so at this point the scale can didn't really know that consuming things of power would bring them evolutionary changes so as they started resorting to cannibalism the ones that were the most aggressive the most violent were the ones that resulted to cannibalism first yeah but those also became the first that started these steps of evolution and rose to become the first dragonborn oh. But this caused that unfortunate chain within their society and that the most violent, the most aggressive became the most powerful. 
because it, because it started with cannibalism, they just assumed that's, that's how they become. It, yeah, exactly. And so oh. they assume anything that they can consume. So it became a very much dog eat dog world. Yeah, literally within the realm of the scale kin. And oh so it became this very dogmatic practice of understanding of that eating and consuming at any moment is acceptable because it means growth. It means more power and getting to the next tier is always going to the, be the most important. So as long as you can overpower your opponent, you can eat them. They're Doesn't, yours. Yeah, if anything, uh, I believe even in the story, Miguel recounts a message of eating his cousin. Oh my God, that's right. So, so <sighs> it is this kind of dogmatic practice of, of, hey, if there's an opportunity and there's a chance to gain power, you better take it yeah. because someone else will do the same. Now, the one thing they pushed on the culture is that there are two important items of every scale kin, mm -hmm. and that is their tail and their wings. Yeah. Now, obviously, kobolds in our world do not have wings, mm -mm. but they do have the tail, which is the starting symbolization of their growth. Yeah. And so it's believed within the scale kin kind that if their tail and or wings are removed, that stops their evolutionary pattern. They will not grow any farther and any stronger. Oh, no. And was used as a tool for for much more of the hierarchy to put down other scale kin in order to ensure that there wouldn't be any more uprising or they would basically stop cannibalizing each other because there'd be no point. So that would allow mm -hmm. them the opportunity con to consume and not miss out an opportunity for them to grow in power. Oh, I see. So the scale kin, as we're seeing, and, and, and as they are one of the mm -hmm. more reclusive species in Extraeus right now, we're only seeing uh, individuals such as Miguel who did not grow up on the island. Yeah, because I was going to say, if they're so cannibalistic, they might, might not have very good familial ties but he seems very close to his mother yeah and and so miguel is unique and is mm -hmm. that his he was brooded from you know here on the hume continent yeah. which allows for kind of a unique kind of system where he doesn't quite know exactly who he is mm -hmm. but he's received a lot of kind of stories and teachings as well as what he's heard through other social commentary about yeah. draconic kind that he kind of has his own ideas, which is causing a lot of the kind of interesting conflicts and dilemmas yeah. that a scale can represent. But the big thing that I, I really wanted to stress with them also is that whatever they consume too changes their outward appearance as well. Oh. So if a, like say a kobold a, or kobold were to consume a lot of rubies mm -hmm. and, and, and consume a fine gemstones of, of wealth and power, they actually would become more of a stone gemstone like dragonborn when they evolve. A ruby dragon. And they would and obviously have that kind of more elemental affinity for that power. So there isn't this wow. kind of tie to, okay, as D&D &D puts the chromatic, the mm -hmm. metallic, that really doesn't actually pertain to anything as there are really no gods in Extraeus. Yeah, not yet. So there isn't anyone saying, Saying you hate this person because this person's this color or this person's this person so mm -hmm. you hate them because they were born on this side of the world right none of that <laughs> no so it's more of just a reflection of how they actually got to where they uh, have ascended to okay. so it's more of like a, a, a story of themselves as they get stronger and larger they will be these kind of composites of all the energies that they've consumed to almost become these like prismatic rainbows of mm. draconic kind the farther and farther they attain uh, like higher ascendancy. Got it. So they don't have the same us and them kind of mentality like 5e chromatic and... Yeah, uh, they really have a me yeah. only kind of mentality is really gotcha. the focus. Most, most scale can really primarily focus on themselves and they also have this kind of middle ground because mm -hmm. when they ascend to uh, wyvern status or even anything higher, they also become more violent creatures. They kind of lose their control of their faculties until they reach kind of the more draconic dragon and their intelligence starts to gain back. But there is a period in the middle where they are kind of more beast than man. Whoa. And so there, that also is kind of the double-edged sword where they mm -hmm. have to kind of worry is, you know, if I become a beast, will I still be the same person if I do manage to ascend to become an adult dragon at yeah. one point and then gain my sentience back? Oh, that's got to be a tough conundrum. Um, so I really wanted to dig deep. And I was, you know, I, I think this creates a, a, a unique nod to both all the historical dragon kind, mm -hmm. but also very much give it that unique spin that Extraeus yeah. loves to do to things. I like that. I like that a lot. But I'm always, I've actually been really interested to hear about <laughs> this. Yeah. What can you tell us about the Elam? 
Ooh, the alum are a really fun species I got to work with. Uh, this is mine. <laughs> so it was super I fun. I know, and I know that's a big deal, and I wanted to make sure you had like that sense of agency, and I yeah. was like, hey, this is the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. Isolated races, who knows what you can create. Right. Um, so this was this was cool. Uh, we we sort of worked on it, like the the creation together, just because we had to figure out like where they came from. Oh, well, yeah. Um, so we decided that when the demon and the fae kind of started first coming into the world uh, of Extraeus, the, the, their chaotic energy that they created by doing so uh, was a sort of direct violation with the planet, right? And the energy of the planet, the primal essence of the planet. And so that primal essence uh, sort of got mad <laughs> without knowing it because oh, yeah. um, they have no actual uh, yeah, thought. Yeah, it went out of balance. And so it had to rebalance itself in the way it did that is by coalescing the elements that existed on Extraeus into beings with thoughts, uh, like I said, in emotions. They, they, they have faculties just like we do. Um, and they were sort of diluted over time. They started off as really powerful uh, elementals of fire and things like that, but eventually uh, with uh, breeding and everything with, with other things, they did sort of achieve a more human kind of look in yeah. the, in and of themselves so you. they lost a little bit of that elemental power but now because they have flesh and body they can procreate they have communities they they move around uh and while they're not as powerful they're also not as uh chaotic as as uh they don't have like the the craziness to explode now that's just the first generation. <laughs> I'm like explode. Yes. Yeah, so the you know the first generation uh, finally got it right where they could wait. They didn't have to like st be away from everybody because they're afraid of hurting people. Gotcha. Uh, they could they could live in community. So they started doing that, and then they started falling in love and having children. And those children, if the two LM parents were not, and even if they were actually from the same elemental force, they could still create a child that that had sort of essences of both of those to create a brand new type. So let's say uh, a fire uh, elem got together with a water elem, then they could make a steam elem child. Which allows, obviously, for even more. Which is more crazy. Unique. Like, how do you catch a child <laughs> that can turn to steam in your hands? Well, like, so how much, like, elemental control do they have over their respective elements? So the first generation has a great control, uh, it, not a uh, not a big uh, like extending control like they can't control like a giant wave or anything but they can control it around them it's sort of okay it's sort of Makes like sense. a shield around them kind of thing uh, and it's and it's uh, fairly small it's not like too far out of themselves uh, think of them like water benders right <laughs> uh, a little like that okay okay uh, and then unfortunately though with the children and then those children having children there's got to be like three or four generations of Elm at this point in the in the continent the keep creating more powerful uh, children and because they have that control now the children also sort of have that control but because they're getting more and more powerful it's starting to go back to that time of the original primal essences gotcha. the Ele the true like crazy elem that had all these amazing powers but couldn't be around anyone they're starting to kind of head back to that so so like the idea is like they they may have less connection, but mm -hmm. they're becoming a much more powerful force. Yes, within themselves. Right. Yeah. Uh, so it's less uh, less outside of themselves. But gotcha. when they do decide, or let's say something horrible happens and they're in the grip of grief, that power can really get out of control if they're not careful. Now I know Luna kind of alluded to that they were kind of helping balance Extraeus. Uh, How yeah. did you write that into the culture? Because the primal essence was in direct. Uh, sort of conflagration with the demonic, the chaotic forces of the demonic and the fae, uh, because they're opposites of each other, they actually counter each other really well. And okay. so the the Elam, uh, without really knowing it, uh, because this all happened during the Reaping Games and a lot of knowledge was lost after that whole situation ended, uh, everyone lost a little bit of knowledge in the world. And so what the Elam lost was the knowledge that they could go sort of toe-to-toe -to -toe with these demonic uh, forces and fey forces. Gotcha. Uh, and they could they could really pack a punch. Uh, now, don't get me wrong, the demonic and fey forces <laughs> could do their own damage, but it was sort of uh, more of an even playing field for the planet, whereas the Hume were getting completely rocked. They, they had no clue how to stop what was happening. Gotcha. 
So, I mean, like, so the biggest thing is, like, once they re- remember, they could be a valuable asset asset to, like, well, protect yeah. the Atreus. And if they do find out that, you know, that they can essentially kill Demon and Fae, perhaps, if they get powerful enough or if they have, you know, enough tools... Uh, they they could pose not just a threat, but like let's say let's say one of them gets a big head right and thinks, well, if I can take on the demon and the fae, yeah, I can rule everything. Why right. not? And then the thought too, which is is kind of that interesting, like where we didn't realize that we're creating connections without realizing it mm-hmm. because you're working on Elam, I'm working on the scale kin. Yeah, and one of the unique aspects as of also the scale kin, which ties into their kind of breath, at, you know, being able to breathe, you know, magics and mm-hmm. fires and whatnot. Uh, it's based on the fact that they do also naturally absorb kind of that primal energy around them. Uh, which gives them that respective elemental breath. So I yeah. feel like that's also kind of a little bit of kind of a, a much smaller aspect of what the Elm is capable mm-hmm. of because theirs is much more of just kind of this passive absorption, yeah. whereas the Elm sound like they'd be much more of this kind of of the element itself. Yeah, it's a little self-generating, but it also does come from the land. It's it's that connection to the land that they have that that sort of fills that power for them as well. Yeah, and, and I think this also comes from a lot of that, the uh, isolationism, mm-hmm. right? So, like, these two species are the ones that are the most isolated. Yeah, and I think if if uh, if travel opens up and people are able to, you know, travel between continents a little better, the situation with the Elam might appe- uh, like ease a little bit because there might be new, essentially new blood introduced into <laughs> the continent, new people to, to breed with, and it might dilute some of that uh, crazy elemental power. Yeah, and it, and it makes total sense, and so it'll be interesting once that kind of gets mm-hmm. more intermingling of the races, because really with these two, they are are kind of the non-native extraeus species yeah the, in, in terms of their origins yes so that you know the the mirren were born of creatures of the land they mm-hmm. were already existed and they kind of evolved into that uh but the primal essence of the elem it was sort of created afterwards and it's they're they're like a consequence of what happened not you know it's sort of an unintended consequence of what happened yeah and and like the scale kin they are technically this kind of remnant uh like the kind of soul essence yeah. which explains how they both have a soul but it's not a native soul of extraeus mm-hmm. it's an alien it's, soul it's a little it's kind of like you're a little bit an alien yeah. they're, they're, and so that does play into For you a little lot sci-fi of, nerds <laughs> right out and it's there. <laughs> and it kind of plays into why they have such a unique physiology and mm-hmm. why they evolve so differently from any of the, from other, the other races. Species, yeah. Whereas they don't necessarily adapt, they just get straight up more powerful. Yeah, they just get stronger. Whereas all the other kind of native races, they more adapt over time mm-hmm. or adapt much more rapidly. Yes. Um, so I think this kind of shows with our, our four ma- kind of major, we still have one more race, but really I, I like how our four kind of major races that occupy the mm-hmm. continents really kind of show those like four different dichotomies between like kind of how you can see a kind of entire species come to fruition. Yeah, a, a, diff- a whole world, you know, we can see these species come together because they've been separated for quite a while, but yeah. we, but the plan is eventually to connect everything <laughs> back together. That's kind of the point of the story, yeah. but we'll go into that much later. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'd love to really get to the point where we can see them interacting with each other. Oh, yeah. And and the big thing, too, is like you see that there's still a lot of like as much as they are different, there are a lot of connections, much like how you say, you know, the Elam are this kind of race of people that were created from the ramifications of demonic and fey mm-hmm. forces coming together. But that's very much the same as the Hellscar. Which yeah. are an you know a Hume variant, which was only birthed through the intervention of demonic forces. Mm-hmm. So that makes for a really cool where it's like, yeah, you are separate, you are different, you are I mean almost in all ways entirely opposite beings. Yeah. But 
they share these similarities mm-hmm. that will eventually, hopefully, bring them together. Because that's the real way that they all are going to be successful is when they actually come Work together, together yeah. as a whole large mm-hmm. group. But as with all stories, there has to be realism. So that's never probably going to ever happen. Or if it does, it's going to take quite a bit to get everyone to work together. But really what this shows is more of also how there is a principal breakdown as to what makes each one with things Mm -hmm. like what we talk about a lot of like souls. And we talk about shard fragments. And we talk then about elemental power. And then we talk about power, a consumption of power. But each one of these creates this cool dynamic to extraeus that allows for not only for any player who picks one of these races to have a very unique dynamic to how their character can change and mm-hmm. be played. I can't wait for a scale kin player. That would oh, be dope. That would be amazing. Uh, but it allows for our unique world to have this very unique spin to what are hard to not be just standard tropes. Yeah, you know, it's really tough to fall into those, but the way that we don't avoid the tropes, right? We we don't shy away from them because they, we know they happen and sometimes they happen for a reason because they're true. Uh, but we try to give them a good, unique spin on the trope so that it's not what everybody has always kind of expected. It's a little different. Oh, yeah. And and the big thing we want, too, is if you have any other questions or if you want mm-hmm. even more knowledge, please jump on to our uh, Extraeus Project Discord. Yep, yep. Uh, that is where we have all things Extraeus. It includes the Couple of Nerds podcast, yeah. everything you can find or resources, mm-hmm. as well as connecting with myself and D&D Wife yeah. here as we try to stream quite frequently. Yeah, we try uh, to hop into chat every now and then so, too. So please join us there because that's where uh, we get a lot of direction as to what topics and, and mm-hmm. how much of the lore we should go in. And hopefully we're not just talking to ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we really hope that everyone can kind of go out there and, and learn more mm-hmm. about Extraeus and kind of see how just taking simple steps, taking it one piece at a time, you too can build your own homebrew world. Oh yeah, it doesn't all have to happen at once. We, we took like a year and a half and we're still building the world. It's not done. No, not, not even at close. All. Holy mm-hmm. cow. We are not even close to being Yeah. Finished. So uh, I think that's that's the point to take away from this perhaps is don't be afraid to start something just because it, it looks daunting to finish. Oh, yeah. It will be finished eventually. Just give it time. Keep chipping away at it. And eventually you'll be, you'll be left with a masterpiece. And those of you who are interested, we're starting up a little bit more on the uh, Couple of Nerds podcast YouTube. So check it out for all new videos. Yeah. Uh, cutouts of the lore drop monologues as well mm-hmm. as the various interviews by our reporter on the ground luna yep artwork also featured on the videos too yeah so please check that out give us a like subscribe if you can show us that you're out there we appreciate everything and please stay tuned for the next lore drop where we look into the last hidden extinct unfortunate race our elves yeah I, for one, am super excited just because I finally get to find out what happened to Luna's people. (laughs) Yeah, considering you're the only true elf remaining on the entire planet, it's probably going to be pretty important. Yeah, uh, so that'll be very, very interesting to note. But again, Luna would not know any of this. Nope. So she's still got the amnesia going on. So be sure to listen (laughs) in next time. And Mm -hmm. thank you all again for everything you give us. Thank you so much. Have a good night. And that concludes today's journey through the realm of Couple of Nerds. We hope you had a blast exploring the intricate world of Extraeus. Don't miss out on the visual extravaganza over at our YouTube page, at Couple of Nerds Podcast. It's where the magic comes to life with exclusive video segments, art previews, and a peek behind the curtain. Dive deeper into our adventures by visiting dndwifestories.com, your haven for all our podcast transcripts and a treasure trove of content dedicated to the captivating universe of Extraeus. Your unwavering support is our greatest treasure. Take a moment to weave your thoughts into a review and hit that subscribe button for an enchanting journey with a couple of nerds. Join us beyond the podcast in the Extraeus Project Discord. Connect with us, the creators, and even the travelers themselves. Witness the magic unfold in live drawing streams, game alongside us, and step into our digital tavern, the Bard's Haven. Share your stories and characters with fellow adventurers. Visit dndwifestories.com for the link to join our vibrant community. Stay tuned for more tales, more laughs, and more insight into the world of tabletop gaming. Until then, may your dice be kind, your campaigns epic, and your adventures legendary.